Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Now historic films made in the spring of 1948 and just released show Enoetok preparing for heavily guarded and still largely secret tests of new atomic weapons. The test's purpose is to measure atomic effects on thousands of different materials, 30,000 tons of them, not as at Bikini to prove military effectiveness. San Francisco police say that nine persons have been arrested in a narcotics raid on the headquarters of the Grateful Dead, a widely popular singing group. Two members of the group, Rod McKernan and Robert Weir, and their business manager, Danny Ripkin, have been booked on suspicion of possessing narcotics. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Well, strange lights are causing a viral buzz on YouTube. Could we have caught extraterrestrial activity on a recent newscast? Brandon Arroyo investigates. As the newscast ended, the controversy began back on September 26th. What is that light shining in the back of the dark night sky? With coverage reaching all the way back to 1948, for over 70 years, Fate magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Now, Faint Magazine Radio is carrying on that tradition of setting the standard in Paranormal Talk Radio as we report and discuss some of the most mysterious and perplexing phenomena imaginable in this strange world of ours. Now, here is your host of Faith Magazine Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Welcome to WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am so glad to welcome y'all. I don't want to start tonight's show without first acknowledging tomorrow. Tomorrow is Veterans Day. I have had a couple of, of Veterans Days now without my dad, who was one. I am so thankful for everyone who has served, and I totally, I totally respect every person who had the willingness to put on that uniform, go out and face uncertainty, and still did it with grace and a plume, and came home, and if you were a Vietnam veteran, I am so sorry with how you were treated, but I love you. So thank you very much for your service, every single one of you. And go take advantage if those people are going to feed you. I know that everybody at the restaurant industry wants to do that. You let them. You earned it, and they appreciate you too. That being said, what a show tonight. I mean to tell you, this is going to be amazing. I was in Phoenix at the International UFO Congress. And I heard a voice that sounded rather like mine. That was unexpected. 
I knew he was going to be there because I'd been talking to him online. I went and found him and his beautiful bride, Waynette, and we got to be talking and friends, and I'm so glad that he is here tonight. I'm talking, of course, about Calvin Parker. Calvin was one of the experiencers in the Pascagoula alien abduction case, October 11th of 1973. I am thrilled to have him here. I I find his story so interesting, and I have got something I haven't told him yet, but it's it's not a big deal, but it was to me. But let's bring you on, Calvin. Are you here? I'm here and ready to go. Thank you. Me too. First of all, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. I know everybody and their brother is wanting to talk to you right now. It, it's it been a busy year. You know, the first book, when it came out, I didn't really expect it to sell or anything, but I was on the go all the time. And I've had to put, kind of put my life on hold. Yes, well, you so, travel so much. I mean, you've been to all these conferences. I hated that I missed you at Ozark Mountain, but I wasn't quite well enough to get there yet. And I'm so glad that I finally got to catch up with you in Phoenix. I it, enjoyed the Ozarks, too. That they uh, That's a beautiful place up there. Yes, it is. And that is a fantastic conference. If I'm not mistaken, that was... That was their 32nd. This year is going to be their 33rd. It I is. Mentioned. And they sent me an invitation to come this year, and I had to decline it because of health right now. I'm having a few little issues and about to get them straightened out, though. Cool beans. Well, I relate. <laughs> yeah, I but but you're right. The, the drive's a little scary going there, but it's well worth it once you get there. That is a... Like a family get together, kind of neat. It, it is nice, and but the biggest thing about it, I get motion sick in a car sometime. And oh my gosh, that drive! You look at yourself <laughs> going around a curb sometime. <laughs> look down, and it's two or three thousand foot to the ground with no guardrail. Right. Yes, that was my first time driving in conditions like that, and that kind of surprised me too. I didn't get sick, but I got awful nervous. <laughs> I just, I let one at drive till she scared me. Then I drove home. Well, there you go. That's, that's kind of the way we do things in this house too. So it works. Well, what was the first con that you were invited to last year? What did you actually get to experience? Well, I went to, uh, Mac Allen, Texas to Nick Torres's, uh, conference and then uh, I went on the travel channel in that uh, UFO contact thing and I had to say I was impressed with the way that turned out because I flew up there one day we filmed one day and then I flew back but it took them something like four or five months to edit this program and they recently called and wanted me to come back. But I was really impressed with the way they did things. And gosh, I can't remember all the shows that I've been on. Now, uh, there's one that called the other day who want me to come to New York and film somebody, something that's all, I forget what it is. I got so much going on, it's just hard to remember. I have to write it down, then I still forget it. <laughs> I feel you on that. New York might be kind of fun. Have y'all been up there? Well, I have. Uh, one of don't like to travel to places like that. She, but she she did loosen up last year and start traveling some with me. And actually, we've never had vacations or anything. And this has been a great opportunity. Most of the time, they'll pay my way to go. but And they give me a... a little speaking thing there and I take that and buy her a plane ticket but she don't like to travel that much and I'm I'm getting where I don't like to travel it wears on you after a bit beg your pardon it wears on you after a bit you, you, know, oh, you get does. to where you don't know if you're 
winding your watch or scratching your head, you know, or vice versa. Well, these airplanes is getting so small and they, you stay cramped up in them and these airports are so big. I know uh, when we went to uh, Laughlin, Nevada, we missed a flight out there because we just didn't have enough time to get to another gate. And it oh, was act of Congress to uh, get that plane ticket rescheduled. We had to go standby then. Mm-hmm. And she don't like traveling by herself. And they had us booked on different flights and all that. So I just waited there till they got us all on the same flight. We did the only thing you could do. They had a slot machine there and a coffee at Starbucks. So we enjoyed the slot machine and Starbucks for a little while. Oh, gosh. Well, that's a stinker. But oh, at least yeah. they had the slot machines, right? That's hard yeah. that that happened in Vegas. And, yeah, and the sad part about it, at the airport, when they call you to get on a plane, you have to get on it. I put $20 in there, and uh, the first pull, I hit three or $400. Well, they was calling the plane to board, and I couldn't find the lady to cash it out. I just handed the ticket over to uh, somebody that looked like they might need it. Told them to find oh. them and cash it in. Oh, my goodness. That was awful kind of you. Well, well I, That doesn't surprise me any. You seem to be. Well, thank you. I, I try to be good to people. But if I could have cashed it in, I, I had to say I would have probably put it in my pocket. <laughs> I understand. I am. I I do understand. Sometimes it is just difficult. So. What on earth. After all that time. Well, it's not really all that time. But when. When you decided to come forward. You had kind of gone into the background a little bit. And just let. um, Your co-abductee. Charlie Higgins. Higgs, good heavens. Let Charlie come forward and do the telling of this story while you just kind of backed away from it, it seemed like. And then you you just started coming back. So, well, you know, what caused that? I didn't want the publicity. Back in 73, People would think you're an idiot if you told them this story. They'd think you was crazy. Although there was a lot of sightings and all around Mississippi at the time, and it was on the news, some of them. But I I was engaged to get married. I got engaged, and um, this happened in October. I was engaged a little bit before that, going to get married in November. Well, her daddy would think I was an idiot, and her whole family would. So that that was one reason because I didn't want to put my family through all this. Right. So Charlie and I just, just kind of agreed uh, that I'd stay in the background and out of it. But I didn't realize he was going to break the story. And after he broke it, I figured maybe uh, a week or two, you know, this would all be history. But it followed me for 45 years. I couldn't get away from the media. Every time I'd go somewhere and they found out who I was, they would start asking questions. Then the media would change the story. And Hmm. if you go, you know, this story's bizarre enough like it is. You don't have to change it to make it any better than, um, or make it more bizarre than what it is. So... I just decided not to have nothing to do with it. And what it did, it turned my life into, I just became a recluse. The only thing I would do was uh, work. I'd get up and go to work, and I'd come work all day and part of the evening. That was my social life. And I didn't realize what this was doing to my family. But, you know, you need to take family time every now and then. You do. And, And... I just became a recluse. I didn't want to be around nobody. And I'm pretty much still that way. You know, I let a few people into my life. And uh, the people that I do let in, you know, I really care for and I love. 
but uh, I don't go out and hang around in public places that much. Well, that was why I didn't invite y'all over to Gulf Shores when I was in Orange Beach when I was doing that conference a couple of weekends ago because I didn't. I was actually speaking on ufology, and I did not want that to be something that I thought was would be a distraction and maybe upsetting for y'all. Well, so, no, it wouldn't be. You know, since um, the first book came out, actually, we was going pub the publisher Philip Mantle was going to let the book come out in September. Mm-hmm. And, but it got released a little bit early somehow and just on the market for a little while. It was so popular and in such demand that we went ahead and released it in July because uh, we just couldn't keep it under wraps in. But he had a busy schedule, and he just had to take off his schedule and tend to this. And, and it was amazing because when this first book came out, I'd have figured it would sell maybe 10 copies and I'd have to buy them and I'd give it to my family and my friends and uh, let them read what happened instead of me having to set everybody down and tell them. But this thing has skyrocketed. And I did. People are just fascinated by this and it's so well documented too. I have to say one thing, and that is the publisher that put the documentation together. Philip Mantle, I couldn't ask for a better publisher or a better friend. Uh, I've never met him face-to-face because he's in the U.K. And the way that all this came about was uh, me and my wife had went to a funeral. One of her neighbors had passed away. Well, we actually went to the wake, and I signed the register. Well, out of 45 years, I've never talked to her and told her anything about what had happened. She never asked me because she figured it would upset me and all. And it really wouldn't. I just didn't like telling the story. So we went to this wake. And while we was at the wake, I did something I normally don't never do. I signed the register, signed my real name to the register because they were neighbors and all. And people started coming up and asking me if I was the Calvin Parker. And it was amazing to me how people would remember you from 45 years back. And at the time that we was at this wake, we didn't want to uh, just take away from the family's grieving that was there, his wife and daughter and all. So we got in a car and left early. Well, on the way home, One it said, why don't you write a book? And I was thinking, you know, I'm not going to write no book. I don't (laughs) have much of an education. I don't want to do this. But just to make her pacify her, and I figured this would pass on after about a week. But just to pacify her, I said, well, you know, if I get a ghostwriter, I might do that. Well, it kind of pacified her then but the next day the publisher uh philip mantle called me and he he didn't call about a book but he called about another book about charlie's book and wanted to talk to me about that i didn't know anything about charlie's book you know i signed a contract with charlie to get a little percentage of it and all but i never received a dime from that book i never read the book didn't care nothing about reading it but he called to ask me some questions about that. Well, in the process of talking to uh, Philip, he uh, he said, well, have you ever considered writing a book? I said, nope. <laughs> I, I really hadn't. He said, well, you know, Calvin, you say that the media changes everything you say and all. If you write a book, it's black and white. That's your legacy. They won't be able to change that. And I got to thinking about that. You know, it made pretty good sense. But again, an uneducated country boy don't know how to sit down and write a book. He said, well, think about it, and I'll call you back in a week. So, you know, I thought about it for about two minutes and 
I was looking at my phone and where it said, uh, you know, where the number was on my caller ID, I mm-hmm. just put no answer because I didn't want to talk to him in two weeks about a book. I'm going to stop you right here because we are at our first commercial break. And I know your wife and I know what happened. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so we will be right back, y'all. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. And we will be right back. Y'all come back. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um... Nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. To the believer, the evidence is overwhelming. To the skeptic, there will never be enough. Hello everyone. Join Kevin and Jennifer Malik, the host of Paraversal Universe, every Friday here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCET FM and The Rift. Log on or tune in as they check out the mysteries found within the eight categories of the unknown and unexplained, including ghosts and haunted places, aliens and UFOs, theology and mythology, cryptids and monsters, urban legends and folklore, conspiracies, metaphysics, and forbidden archaeology. Listen as Kevin and Jennifer interview the top minds in their respective fields as they share theories and information regarding these unsolved mysteries. For future show and archive information, one can find Paraversal Universe on Facebook, Twitter, and MeWe under various Paraversal Universe headings. So, for excellent talk radio about the unknown and unexplained, check out Paraversal Universe, where all paranormal perspectives apply. Brought to you by the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society, LTV, and produced by WBHMDB.com. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I am Kat Hobson. I am the voice of Fate Magazine online, joined by Calvin Parker. I hope that you've enjoyed the show so far. It's about to get a lot deeper. And Calvin, I do apologize for interrupting you. We were where um, you had blocked out Philip and decided you were not going to do this at all. Yeah, in my mind, you know, I this would have passed on after a little while. But I was at the boat landing one day when he was supposed to call. He called exactly when he was supposed to a week later. And my phone was ringing. Well, I didn't know if it was something wrong at home or what it was. And I was busy loading the boat. And I had no answer on the phone, you know, but I didn't look at my caller ID and it was Philip. Well, I didn't want to be rude to the man because, you know, we agreed to call. And uh, that's when we first started talking about the book. He said, well, have you thought about the book? And I wanted to say, why heck no, I hadn't thought about the book, not going to. But then he started talking and Wynette was pushing on the other end for me to do this. And uh, 
I told Philip, I said, look, the only way that I would do a book is uh, I don't want anything edited in this book. I don't want a period put where it's not supposed to be. I don't want a question mark. I don't want to misspell word corrected. I want this book in my language, and that's good old redneck boy. Well, he agreed to that, and he took a lot of flack over it because, uh, well, I can't say a lot of flack, but that's, uh, you know, mispunctuation and misspelled words and stuff like that. And the only word that he changed in the back of the book was a bloney sandwich, and he changed it to a blondie sandwich. And I was reading alone, <laughs> yeah. I was reading through their proof of the book, and I seen it, and I got tickled. Well, people have to remember, he's from the U.K. He had no idea what a bologna, burnt bologna sandwich was. And uh, What is a blondie sandwich? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what I want Because I'm from know. the South, too, and I know what a burnt bologna sandwich is, but I do not know what a blondie sandwich is. Well, I know, and uh, I guess he assumed that on himself. I get, uh, you know, I watched that Blondie and Dagwood show, and right. it might oh, be something yeah. she did. I bet. So, anyhow, me and him made an agreement, and we agreed to that. And uh, I went home. I told my, uh, my wife, I said, look, I'm going to do this book. I said, Philip told me it would probably take me three or four years to do it. I said, but that's crazy because I can read a book in a week, you know, a big book. So I believe we can just do this in a week. Now, if you don't care how the book's written, if you're just writing it in your words and you don't have to sit there and think about it. And this was a thought that had been burning my mind for 45 years, so I didn't have to do any thinking. I told one Ed, I said, look, I'm going to try this. I came back to the room, my office. I said, don't let anybody interrupt me. Once a day, bring me something to drink, bring me something to eat. I don't want to take no phone calls. I don't want to see nobody. Make everybody just leave me alone. So uh, we did that. With two or three weeks' time, you know, I had I had the first uh, – draft sent out and I sent it to uh, Philip and he looked at it and he emailed me back we was working through email and he said that's quite a mess <laughs> well I knew it was <laughs> he said let me give you a little outline on what to do and he outlined it uh, he said the first chapter you need to tell about yourself second chapter tell where you met Charlie how you knew Charlie. Third, go into your experience. The fourth, keep on, you know, and just so on. Well, I went back to my room again, two days time. You know, I just took that jumbo, jumbo mess that I had out and I put it together kind of in chapters and sent it to him like that. Well, he went ahead and published a book like that. And believe me, it, it it's it's hit the market and, and it just went off the shelves and people uh, say look this is like sitting in a, your living room and you telling us a story out front when we get into the book and actually I was amazed because of the audio it, it came out in an audio book mm -hmm. and they sent us a little draft of it. Well, I actually sat down and listened just to see how the guy did that was translating because he was from uh, the U.K. also, and I didn't think they spoke too good English there, and they were really the ones that invented the English language. But this guy did a great job on the book, and it amazed me to sit there and listen to the whole thing. And we'd put it in the car and listen to it. You could put the words in it, and he, Philip added what he'd added to it. But you never really realize how it turns out until you sit back and just listen to the book. But the first book made a bestseller. And what it did, it brought every, everybody uh, 
out of the woodworks what I'd like to say. It brought new witnesses, new evidence, and we was just going to do add to the first book a little bit. And by the time the second book was finished, it was as big as the first one. I think about 800 pages or four, five, I don't know. And uh, I don't know how sales is going on it. I don't keep up with it, but it must be pretty good. And the first book now is out in French, German, Portugal, Russian. Uh, it just keeps coming out. And it's really amazed me. Well, it, it is amazing because we're talking a 45-year-old experience that that was out, that was discussed at one point. Your experience, and I'm going to tell you, I have talked to several people who have experienced abductions of different time periods and different type of beings and craft and such. You are one of two people I know who were not passive about what happened to you. No. You initially were because you felt like you had been drugged, if I'm not mistaken, but you did not remain passive. No, and... Uh, but you're only one of two people that's ever told me that. Well, you know, to me, it's it was like a crime. It's it like was. somebody kicking in your front door and coming in there, dragging you out of your house, taking you to the van, and uh, drugging you and giving you a physical. So it was just like a crime that... Uh, uh, I compare it to a home invasion. Mm-hmm. And, and if somebody did that and come in my door, I'm going to shoot them. There ain't no doubt in my mind about it. And, you know, I love people. I love being around people, and I'm a Christian. But uh, they're, I'm not going to take no bull from them. Well, but, as you, you shouldn't. I mean, I agree with you. What happened, I think that what happens often is perceived that way, but people are too afraid or they're too numb or they're just like, this cannot be happening. I am so not looking at this and experiencing this and they just get isolated from their own experience, I think. Yeah, and with my experience, I wanted to isolate it. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want nobody talking to me about it. I didn't want to do all these. Although through the years, WLOX would hunt me down and I'd give them a little interview, but it wasn't uh, much of an interview. I'd just say, I don't know. And actually, I don't know what happened to me. You know, when you get right down to the brass tacks of everything, we don't know where they're from, who they are, and what happened. And I I can honestly say I'm on a quest now to get answers. And if I can get them 45 years later, then uh, it it should be some answers out there. So I can still say I don't know, but I am. And that's one reason that I go to these conventions. Another reason, it's it's a free vacation. I can get my wife out, to be honest with you. Yeah. And I've never took time with her to... uh, take her out in public. And when we was in public, I would just not be me. You know, I'd be somebody else. And, uh, was that when you were trying to kind of hide from the experience or somebody coming up and bringing it up? It was. And, uh, you know, if somebody would come up and see me and ask me about something, you know, I'd just say, well, I don't know who this guy is. And my family did a good job helping me hide everything. I've got a brother that I I love so much, and he died of an aneurysm a couple uh, two years ago. I'm sorry. And he, well, he retired out of the uh, service. Also, he was a veteran, and, and he he had been on to me to write a book also, but he did it in a nice way. And I had never even sat down and talked to him about it. Like I say, I never told my wife, my friends, my family. Nobody knew about this experience until the book came out. 
And the book's been a blessing because it, when it came out, it released me to talk freely about it to them. And uh, I say, well, maybe I'm not as big an idiot as everybody thought I was, or maybe I'm not crazy. The people in Jackson County here, well, I have to say the whole Mississippi Gulf Coast has accepted me so well and not ridiculed. I got another book signing coming up the 15th, and we do this regular. We had one uh, last month, but the weather was so bad, you know, they kind of canceled it and nobody showed up. And it looked like it's going to be bad again on the 15th. But, you know, they've accepted this. They put a plaque up. A, mo- a historical Which is monument. Cool. I I don't know of any like it anywhere. I'm sure it is somewhere, but you know, not on this subject. And I, the the whole city came out. I remember the first book signing we had when the book came out. They had it on the night of October 11th, and it was actually a Thursday. This was all uh, last year, and I didn't figure anybody would show up. So uh, I was sitting there, and she said, oh, you can't go outside, not right now, because there's so many people hunting you, I won't never get you back. This is Rebecca Davis and uh, with Main Street. I said, what? She said, yeah, people's wanting to see you. Well, they shut the whole block down. They was oh, lines my. wrapped all the way around the block, just came there just to meet me and for me to sign their books and talk to them just a second. And I I always like taking my time, but there wasn't no time that night. You know, some people complain because we kind of rushed them through. Well, they invited me also to speak and, you know, tell a little bit. And she said, "Uh, look, you got 10, 15 minutes. I want you to get up there briefly tell your story. I ended up up there for two hours straight, and I still wasn't finished when I left. People asking questions and me telling what happened. And it, it was a good experience, you know, and it really surprised me that uh, I enjoyed speaking to the public like I did. But You're uh, good at it. You didn't know that then, though, did you? No, I didn't. I knew coming up as a kid I wanted to be a Baptist preacher, and... Uh, you know, I, I could stand up in the church and talk to people and pray and uh, give a sermon when I was 12, 15 years old. And then all this happened when I turned 18 years old, and that put a damper on all that. But I was actually, the only reason I was going to school was to uh, make a preacher, and I was going to go to uh, really learn the Bible and all. But... That broke everything up. I had to get out and get a job and go to work. And I traveled all over the world. And when I say all over the world, I was working in the oil field and construction. And I'd be overseas 90% of my life. I've probably spent more time in Singapore and North Sea and Onan, Libya, Iran, I I spent a lot of time working over there before they got so violent. I mean, I wouldn't go over there now, not by choice. I agree. I don't think I would either. I have to tell you that we are getting a slew of questions in the chat room. So that's going to be coming up on you here in a little bit. Okay. But, But they are very much enjoying you sharing how you got to this point. You know, I am I am so impressed with the fact that you enabled people to come forward to share their experiences that happened to them in that same time frame. And I'm going to tell you, I posted about it in the event, but you and I hadn't talked about it. I shared your experience as part of my, my UFOlogy discussion. I had a couple of people that I thought were very credible um, abductees. You're one of them. I think that your story is not a story. I think that this is absolute truth. 
And I think that you're just great at getting this information out. And I'm glad that you finally came forward with your, your side of this, your experience of this. And because everybody experiences things, Charlie's and your experience, although you were both in the same situation, were very different because you're different people having the same experience. And this woman came up to me when I finished and she was like, you know what? I am, I am from Gulfport. And I saw craft that night. And I was like, how do you know it's that night? She said, because I wrote it in my diary. Diary. And I was like, wow, did you really? And she was like, yep. She said, because I've never had anything like that happen. And I've never had anything like that happen since. So, yeah, I did make a note of that. She said, and I remember when this happened and it was so awful, but I don't know that they were the only abductees that night or in that period. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, you have Eglin air force base, you have NAS Pensacola, you have Keesler, you have the coast guards and mobile and the new Orleans area. You've got all these places where something could be going up from. And, Nobody came forward to say that, you know, there were aircraft out that night, you know, trying to debunk your story. Not that I've been able to find. So, you know, and when she said, oh, yeah, <laughs> I saw that, you know, it was just like Jiminy Crickets. Would you look at that? And she wouldn't give me her name. And I was no. like, I know he would like to talk to you. <laughs> you know? And if you don't, if you're not comfortable giving me your name, reach out to him because, you know, there's a second book. And but she was just absolutely, yeah, I've never had that happen. I read it in my diary. That's why I know when it was. Well, oh, wait a minute. We have to go to break. I'm so sorry. But hold that thought, okay? Okay. All right, and we will be right back, guys. Y'all come right back with us. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. 
Welcome back. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. My guest tonight is Calvin Parker. And Calvin, Sherry and Walt and Chat would like to know what actually happened, what your actual experience was. And I interrupted your train of thought. So if you'd like to continue with what you were saying, then we can move over to a description of your experience. Well, just either any way y'all want to work it. We can go into the experience or uh, my chain of thought stays interrupted anyway. <laughs> well, okay. We've got about 15 minutes before we go to the, to the top of the hour break. So we can always pick it back up when we come back. Right. If we need to. So, yeah, why don't you go ahead and share with them what actually happened to you? Because I just realized we didn't discuss that. My apologies. Well, this actually started a couple of days before this event. And when I say that, I was working in the oil field, engaged to get married. And I was working 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, I was hunting a job. Well, my father told me, you know, call Charlie up. He's working at a shipyard down in Pascagoula. And maybe you can change jobs and you have some time off. So I called Charlie and I went to work for the F.B. Walker and Son shipyard. Well, the first day I was there, the very first day, we got off work. He said, uh, would you like to go fishing? And I said, yeah, you know, but I didn't bring any fishing equipment. Well, here in the South, he said, uh, well, I have equipment, but that that's a sacred thing, borrowing somebody's fishing equipment. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, they just soon give you a family member or something if you're going to do that. Well, I agreed to go. So we went out, went to his house and picked up the equipment. And the first place we went, I don't know if most of the people don't know what a Sims is or no Sim, what they call them, but they got a mouth the size of a giraffe, but you can't see them and they sting when they get on you and they come by thousands, not just one. So this was the first spot and I just couldn't stand it and he couldn't either. He said, well, let's go. I know another spot where I don't think they'd be as bad. It's at the old Shaw Peter shipyard up by Highway 90. And we went over there, and when we pulled in, I noticed there was no trespassing sign there, and there was debris. This was an abandoned shipyard that had been out of business for a while. And I noticed there was debris laying all over the uh, ground. I said, Charlie, you know, they need to do a little, little better about picking up their own trash, you know. He said, well, they're out of business, and... Uh, when the flood water comes in, it brings this debris, and then when it goes out, it just leaves it on the bank. Well, that made sense. I said, now, how about this no trespassing sign? He said, well, just don't pay no attention to that. I fish here all the time. I said, okay, if I go to jail, you're going to get me out. He said, I will. <laughs> Famous so, last words. Yeah. So we left. We started walking to the uh, pier and taking our fishing equipment. And it took us probably 15 minutes to go a hundred yards down there to the pier because of all the debris. Well, we pulled a log up. We sat down on the pier and I was looking across the river. There was a big ship over there and it was, uh, either a coast guard cutter or a Noah ship for the weather or something. And I was thinking to myself, I remember clearly what I was thinking. How does something made out of steel float? And that was what was on my mind. And I noticed some blue lights reflecting from my back coming across the river. And I stood up and turned around and looked. And about that time, Charlie stood around. Well, actually... It's the color of the lights on the patrol cars around here, and I figured they was down there to run us off. So uh, we stood up and turned around and looked, and then we was hit with a real bright beam. And, I mean, it was blinding. 
And when we got where we could adjust our eyes, I could see just a little bit. I noticed there was three bulky looking creatures coming toward us. Now, these things looked like they was mechanical to me, you know, the way the movement and all was. And they didn't have a neck or nothing. It looked like their head just sat down on their shoulders. Well, two of them got a hold of Charlie and one of them got a hold of myself. And they glided us up to the ship. Now, I've lost sight of Charlie by now because when they got a hold of my arm, I felt kind of an injection or heard a little poof of air, really. And then it just kind of settled me down. But I couldn't move my body, but I could roll my head a little bit and roll my eyeballs and look. And we was going toward the door, and I noticed the bright light still shining on us. We got at the door, and this thing kind of paused for a second. Now, my chain of thought was, where's all this bright light coming from? It looked like the light was coming from the walls. It was just illuminating out of the walls. And he made a little left turn at the door and went down the hallway and kind of made a little right turn. And this is what I'm going to call the examination room. There was a glass-looking table in there, and this robotic-looking creature glided over to the uh, this glass table that was on an angle, and he laid me on this table, and he backed up and just got in a corner, and like he just shut down. I mean, there wasn't nothing going on with him anymore. And that's mm-hmm. kind of why I thought he was a robot. And then uh, out of the ceiling comes something about the size of a deck of cards, it dropped down about a foot, a foot and a half from my head. And then it started revolving around my head. And as this thing revolved, it was clicking. And when it got back up to my forehead, it got clicked one more time and then just shot back into the ceiling and more or less just disappeared. Hmm. Well, this is when I sensed the presence. And I didn't see nothing then, but I kind of sensed the presence. So I rolled my head a little bit to the right. And what I call the female creature. Now, I don't know if it was female or not. I just sensed it was. And uh, it's like a uh, man can tell a woman and a woman can tell a man. And... You know, living down here on the coast and in New Orleans, you get that second sense Mm -hmm. about women because you have a lot of men that dress like women down here. Well, I sensed this was a woman, and she was coming out toward me, and I didn't notice uh, anything about her. She didn't really have no breast, and... uh, the only thing that I noticed was her hands. Her hands looked human. She looked human. But her t- two middle fingers was a little bit longer on each hand than what they was. When she first grabbed me by the, kind of by the cheek and pinched, it, pinched on it like your grandmother would, just feeling my skin, I guess. And I didn't have no sensation of any kind of feelings. And then all of a sudden, she took her left hand and she pushed down on my jaw and took her right hand with the two longer fingers and run them down my throat. And you got that little thing that hangs down in the back of your throat. Now, what it is, what the medical terms are for it or not, but I call it my little hang-me-down. She tried to come up with her fingers on the back side of that and go up in my nasal cavities. Well, I was choking My nose started bleeding. I was choking. Well, she just stopped and pulled her fingers out of my throat. And telepathically, she said, we're not going to harm you, hurt you. But she did that, and this was surprising to me. She did that in a southern slang. Really? Now, I did not realize that. Oh, yeah. It was so just like it was like giving I, trying to comfort you. Yeah. And uh I figured that they probably studied the language and the people and everything before they had come down. 
but uh, it was just like a little redneck girl you might have met in a bar or something, you know, talking to you. And that made me feel a little better, but it, all through the years, it made throw doubts in the back of my mind, too. I could see that. But she said, we're not going to harm you. And she kind of backed up out of the way and made a mumbling noise. And I described this noise. If you ever been in the South, and I know you, you live down here, that uh, an alligator's mating call mm -hmm. in the spring when they come out with that, that's kind of what it sounded like. And it just carried all over. And that's all of a sudden. That's an odd sound for for her it to be is. using. Yeah, and that was surprising to me also. And I was starting to get a little worried by this time. But when she did that, that big ugly creature standing in the corner popped up like a jack in the box and just more or less came alive. And he came back over and grabbed me by the arm. And you could hear that little poop of air again. And I thought, that was an injection they gave us to kind of uh, settle us down. Now, did he have normal hands? No. His hands was uh, like they had mittens on them, or I described them as crab hands. Like claws. Like claws, yeah. And what surprised me was when they picked us up, you know, I was probably 140 pounds in. It should have broke my arm in half the way they picked us up, but it was no pain there either. So they glided us back out of the crowd. And, uh, well, I want to back up just for a second, if you don't mind. When she called him over to, to, basically tranquilize you again was she done with you or did she finish what she had started to do apparently she must have finished what she started and I'm thinking that that was put some kind of uh, uh, whatever they call it into you to track, to track you or maybe monitor your health or something like that uh but I, I believe it was some kind of implant that she put there. Because after this, my nose bled on a regular basis. Almost every day I would have big nosebleeds and all. Even to the stage that I would have to, uh, to go to a doctor to get them to stop sometime. So it would be I'm, scary for somebody that had never really had that experience. Oh, it was scary. And uh, I'm not going to lie, you know, it scared me to death. Uh, and, but when uh, she got through with me, she was pretty much through with me and backed out of the way. Now, somebody said, was there others in the room and all? I don't know if it was any others than her or the big ugly one. But I felt a presence like somebody was watching me the whole time. But everybody has to remember, and I was pretty much paralyzed. I couldn't look around the room mm -hmm. like I wanted to. Well, probably y'all were being monitored in that situation, I would think. If I were somebody that was going around pretty much you know, bagging and tagging earth beings, I would want there to be a supervisory person to make sure that everything went the way it was supposed to go. And maybe yeah. intervene if that didn't. And well, you like struck say, out at her, though, didn't you? Yeah, now this was in 93. Oh, well, we'll get to that. Because that was another one of the questions in chat. But, um, so, when you got out of the craft in 73... The well, big guy just grabbed you and took yeah, you back. Yeah, he, he'd come over. He picked me up by the arm again and took me back out to the river, facing the river, almost to the same spot he picked me up. 
and I was facing the river with my arms outstretched. And that's when I heard Charlie calling my name. He said, Calvin, Calvin, you okay, son? And uh, I thought, well, heck, no, I'm not okay, you know. I've been a... <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I've got, you know, my physical and all over with here, you know, abducted. At the time, I didn't know that I was really abducted. I didn't know what had happened. But just putting two and two together, the only thing you can go on is uh, the facts. Uh, and that's when I decided, you know, 45 years later that I was abducted that time. So uh, anyhow, they put us out by the river. And Charlie and I sat down and we agreed at the time not to tell nobody nothing. I thought, well, we made our way back to the car. I got to the car. We didn't get in no big hurry. I'm going to stop you because this is about to get intense and very detail-oriented. And we have to take a break. So, everyone who's listening, I promise Calvin will be bringing you this. And you will not believe what they did. It was the most intelligent thing I've ever heard of of a person in this situation doing. I wouldn't have thought of it. But anyway, we'll be right back. I hope you are too. This is our top of the hour news break. It's a great time to go and stretch those legs, fill those mugs, coffee, beer, wine glass, Coca-Cola, whatever floats your boat. But we'll be right back. Thank you for being here and I look forward to the rest of the show and I know you are too. Support for this podcast and the following message come from the University of Florida Warrington College of Business. Earn your master's online or on campus from America's number seven public university, according to U.S. News and World Report. More at warrington.ufl.edu slash masters. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. Ava Morales has resigned as president of Bolivia after nearly 14 years in office. NPR's Philip Reeves reports the news was greeted with celebrations on the streets of the country where there have been weeks of protests. Morales was the first indigenous person in Bolivia to hold the highest office. His downfall was brought about by his willingness to bend the rules in order to stay in power. Last month he declared victory in an election that's now been found by the Organization of American States to be riddled with flaws. That rigged poll triggered weeks of opposition protests that paralyzed the country and saw numerous violent clashes with many injuries and several deaths. As the protests gathered momentum, the police this weekend began to desert Morales, followed by some of his political allies and then the head of the armed forces who appeared on TV and said Morales must go. Philip Reeves, NPR News. Lawyers for the whistleblower who set off the impeachment inquiry say House Republicans have not responded to an offer to make the person available to answer written questions under oath. As NPR's Bobby Allen reports, it's been a week since the whistleblower's legal team made that offer. The letter was sent to Republican Representative Devin Nunes, the ranking member of the Intelligence Committee. While other Republicans have said a written correspondence would not be adequate, the whistleblower's lawyers say Nunes has ignored the offer. House Republicans have listed the whistleblower on a wish list of possible witnesses as the impeachment hearings go public. But Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff dismissed that request. Schiff says the whistleblower's testimony is unnecessary and keeping the individual anonymous is a top priority. President Trump, meanwhile, continues to call for the whistleblower to be unmasked, despite objections from government accountability advocates who say that could discourage future whistleblowers from stepping forward. Bobby Allen, NPR News, Washington. Six pro-democracy legislators who were arrested in Hong Kong this weekend are due in court tomorrow. NPR's Julie McCarthy says the case comes at a sensitive time. The arrests began Friday when Hong Kong gathered in emotional vigils for a university student who died in circumstances that many protesters say raise questions about the possible involvement of the police. Police vehemently deny any role in his death. But the arrests also come two weeks before crucial elections in Hong Kong, which will be a measure of public support for the government. The lawmakers say the clampdown on them is an attempt to provoke more unrest and thus justify canceling the elections. 
NPR's Julie McCarthy reporting. The Supreme Court takes up the Trump administration's plan to end legal protections that shield 660,000 immigrants from deportation. It's the third time in three years that the administration is asking justices to rescue a controversial policy that has been blocked by several lower courts. The Supreme Court hears arguments Tuesday. You're listening to NPR News from Washington. Bernard Tyson, the chairman and CEO of Kaiser Permanente, has died. And here's Meg Anderson has more. Tyson was the first African-American to hold the position of CEO at Kaiser Permanente, which provides health care coverage for more than 12 million Americans. He took over as CEO in 2013. Tyson was an active participant in the country's debate surrounding the Affordable Care Act and pushed for a bipartisan bill. He spoke with NPR's David Green in 2017. One of the beauties of our country is the freedom to disagree, the freedom to speak about those disagreements. And I believe that we will continue to evolve to solve these problems. Tyson died unexpectedly in his sleep early Sunday, according to a company statement. He was 60 years old. Meg Anderson, NPR News. At the weekend box office, Midway took the top spot, bringing in an estimated $17 million in ticket sales. The film about the Battle of Midway featured a large ensemble cast, including Nick Jonas and Patrick Wilson. The film cost a reported $100 million to produce. In second place, Warner Brothers' Dr. Sleep, with $14 million in ticket sales. The Stephen King adaptation starring Ewan McGregor was made for about $50 million. Playing with Fire, the family-friendly comedy about firefighters opened in third place with $12 million. And in fourth place, Last Christmas, coming in with $11 million in estimated ticket sales. I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News from Washington. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back. You are listening to Parent. Faith Magazine Radio here on Paranormal Experience Radio, WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am so glad you're here. We are having a great show. My guest tonight is Calvin Parker. Calvin was one of the abductees in Pascagoula, Mississippi, October 11th, 1973. He is sharing his experience with us now. We are to the point, Calvin, where you were trying to figure out what on earth to do because you've actually just been released, basically, is the only term I can think for that. Right. And uh, when we got on the pier, you know, it wasn't in no hurry then. The damage was done to get away from there. So Charlie and I sat there for a few minutes And we didn't talk about the experience that we had, but the biggest thing I wanted was, you know, we don't need to tell nobody, Charlie. Oh, he agreed not to tell nobody. Well, on the way home, we we got back to the car. We had a lot of trouble getting a car cranked. Now, this was a brand new car, and something fried some of the electrical system in it, but we did eventually Mm -hmm. get it going. And, uh, well, spark plug wires have graphite in them and the graphite in the wires was eat out in some of spark plugs. So we got the car going and on the way home, I thought we was going home. There was a curb store. Well, everybody got to keep in mind back in the seventies, there weren't, nobody had cell phones. It was too expensive. There wasn't social media. The only thing we had was an old pay phone that we could stop and use. So Charlie said, pull over there. <clears throat> I need to make a phone call. Well, we had to hunt a dime to put in the phone. And he got out. I thought he was going to call his wife and tell her we was on the way home or we was late. And he made a call and he come back. And he said, they told me to call the uh, local authorities. I said, who told you to call the local authorities? He said, Kaysler Air Force Base. I tried to call and talk to them, and they wanted me to call the local authorities. So, Holy wow. Yeah. I I did not know he called Kaysler. I had forgotten. Yeah. 
Yeah, he did, you know, because I guess at the time, Project Blue Book had just abandoned that in the 60s. And that wasn't too long after, you know, just a few years that mm-hmm. they abandoned it. Well, he hunted another dime, and he went and called the local authorities, and uh, they told us to stay right there, that they would be there in just a minute. Well, of course, they thought we was drinking or on drugs or something back in, because he kind of went into a brief description of what I guess what happened to him. Well, they was good to the word, and... They told us not to leave, just stay there. Well, here come a patrol car up in just a minute. Well, they got out, and instead of going over on his side of the car and talking to him, I was the one driving. So they took me out of the car, and they shined a little flashlight in my eyes, told me to follow the flashlight with my eyes. And they said, oh, we, we need to see your driver's license. So I showed them my driver's license. <clears throat> they said, now, I want you to stand on one foot, one leg, bend your head back, close your eyes, touch your nose, jump up and down and count from 100 backwards. I said, I'd go to jail on the, on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> I said, hell, man, I couldn't do that if I was sober, much less drinking. <laughs> But I went ahead and I did what they asked me to. They said, well, you seem good enough to drive. Follow us to the sheriff's department, which it was just across the bridge, just a few minutes. They never would. If they had thought I'd been drinking, they never would let me drive to the sheriff's department. We got to the sheriff's department and uh, they did another little alcohol test and proved I hadn't been drinking. Well, they took Charlie into a room and was interrogating him. They took me into a different room, interrogating me. Then when they got through, they put us in a room together. Well, we didn't know there was a tape recorder hid in this room, and they was monitoring our conversations that Charlie and I was having private, and they thought that we would laugh about it or say it was a hoax or something. But You so did not. No. I po- when- Just so people know, I posted part of that transcript in the event on the Facebook Fate Mag Radio page. So you can go and read in detail what was recorded of them. And it was not laughing and joking about a hoax. By this time, I was scared anyway. Well, the sheriff, Fred Diamond, came into the room. And he didn't say nothing, but he hadn't listened to the tape recorder yet. And he must have got the tape recorder wherever he had it hid and walked outside and listened to it. And uh, it just kind of shocked him. It floored him. And he called us up. He said, look, I want to talk to y'all tomorrow. I need to see you again tomorrow. Well, but they had already told us, look, this is a hoax or something. Y'all going to jail. Mm-hmm. But I didn't care about it. I thought, well, hell, jail's better than uh, where I was. You know, I'd rather be in jail than I had there anyway. So he said, y'all go home. Well, we left and uh, started going home. But we had asked the sheriff's department not to say nothing to nobody, or I had. And he said, well, we're not in that line of business. We're not in the news business. Mm-hmm. We're just here to protect the citizens and all. So we left and went home. Well, when we got back, I was renting a room from Charlie. I went into the bathroom, <clears throat> and there was a gallon of bleach sitting on the tub. I felt like I had been watching them Apollo missions where they isolated their families and Everything mm-hmm. else for seven days. And I knew this wasn't normal, what had happened. Well, I was concerned about giving somebody else some kind of infection or any of that. And now this was my mindset because I had been watching about this contamination stuff with Apollo missions. Had uh, quarantined these guys for seven days. Wouldn't even let them see their families. 
I pulled all my clothes off, my shoes, everything, put them in a paper bag that was there in my room that I had used to uh, move some of my stuff in there with. I, I got in the shower and I poured this gallon of bleach over my head because I remembered my mom used to wash me with bleach, get rid of poison ivy or anything else that my dad was, you know, because that was just the old time and yeah. way. And uh, I washed off of this bleach and took my clothes and threw them in a dumpster. You know, put on more clothes and took these out and put them in a dumpster. Well, the next morning we got up and went back into uh, fixing to go to work just like nothing happened. Uh, I don't know if Charlie had told his wife what had happened or not. You know, that's just up in the something kind of up that I didn't ever ask him about. But we got up and we left and went into work. Well, I noticed, now this is my second day of work. There is a, a lot of cars around there. I wasn't for sure how many cars were supposed to be there or anything. And uh, we went in, we brassed in, we went into the shipyard. We wasn't in our four or five minutes. They called her name on the intercom and told us to come to the office. So we left and went into the office. We got there, and the owner of the shipyard was there. He said, y'all got to do something. We cannot conduct business. The press is ringing the phones off the hook. Oh, my word. We can't even use our telephones or conduct any business. And if we let y'all go back out on the yard, the man's going to want to talk to y'all. So... I need y'all to give a press release so these people will leave us alone. I have an attorney, what he said. It works for the shipyard. I got him coming down. Y'all tell him what happened, and he's going to give a press release. So uh, this attorney came down, Joe Camingo. I won't never forget him. And he started questioning me. I said, I don't know what happened. Uh, and I didn't really know. As far as I was concerned, a bunch of rednecks got into a experimental craft and come over and having fun. But anyhow, Charlie sat down and explained to him what was going on. He, uh, and how the press found out, I don't know, but Charlie explained to the attorney what was going on. Well, they gave a press release. By that time, the sheriff, the big sheriff, Fred Diamond, and one of his chief deputies showed up. And uh, I had expressed to him the night before my concern about yeah. giving some kind of virus or bacteria infection or something to somebody. Well, he came down. He said, look, we need to take you to uh, the hospital and get y'all checked out. He loaded us up in his patrol car. We left and went to the Sangin River Hospital and seen Dr. Bosco, and they did blood work. They did all kind of special exams. They examined our arm when we got that shot, or what I thought was a shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, I believe y'all okay. Now y'all need to go get checked for radiation. And they had made arrangements right. to go to Kiesler Air Force Base to get checked for radiation. They put us back in the patrol car, and we left there, and we went into Kiesler Air Force Base, and they just let us come right on in the gate. They had an escort there, and they escorted us all the way to the back of the base. And we got there. There was uh, five or six guys on the little loading ramp. They had hazmat suits on. Don't you think this is weird? I mean, did I you did. at the time realize how strange it was that the Air Force was actually fine with bringing a couple of guys that had been out fishing illegally with, you know, um, posted property in to, <laughs> to do all this stuff? I mean, Kiesler is a fairly tightly secured base. I've been there. And... That is too weird. Well, and cool, to, but weird. Yeah, to me, they had to know something went on. Where were they? Yeah. But uh, let know. me ask you this: 
We've got 30 seconds until our next break. You want to go ahead and take it so we can get it behind us? Yeah, let's do that. All right, we'll be right back, guys, and then we'll be able to get this continued and a couple of other questions. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Several U.S. presidents are on record talking about the UFO mystery. Yeah, presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both had UFO sightings of their own, but the current presidential campaign might be the first in which UFO disclosure has been championed by a major party candidate. DIA, CIA, it moves around, is operating a program to train psychic spies to spy and use their powers against Russia. John Ronson writes about this in The Men Who Stare at Goats. The first known sighting of a ghost took place right after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated uh, in the late 1860s during the administration of Ulysses Grant. Project Paperclip, Clinton releases it all in 1998. Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say to you, still think it's a meteor, Professor. I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. It's a place where UFO hunters and scientists gather to examine paranormal activity in the region. Some of the documents, this is bringing Nazi scientists into the United States to work here. So we fought against the Nazis. And it's not, this again is not a revelation. As early as 1947, 1946, we knew some of this, right? On the paranormal, will we see U.S. President Barack Obama's foreign policy go intergalactic in a quest for gold stolen by aliens? We'll tell you at least how the White House responded to claims the chief executive has been teleporting to Mars. So let's get to today's Capital Account. UFOs, hauntings, psychic abilities, conspiracy, ESP, cryptozoology. There are many things that remain unexplained in the inexplicable world around us. And we're talking about them here looking for answers on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. The truth is out there. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio out of Birmingham, Alabama on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. I am so glad that you are here because Calvin Parker is sharing his experience and we are to the point where you are at Keesler. That is just so wild. So the... the, the and they had a sure. protocol. Yeah. And they managed at this loading dock told everybody to back off and unloaded Charlie and I out of the car onto this dock. And they used, I don't know what they used to check for radiation, but then I heard one of the guys after a minute or two say, all clear. And uh, they took their hazmat suits off. They said, y'all need to go in. They want to see y'all at the end of this hall. Well, I couldn't understand why they wanted to see us, but, you know, you oblige them. So we walked through a door, and it seemed like that's the longest hallway I've ever walked down in my life. And we got into a conference room where they had uh, military officials. They had the mayors, the local police chiefs from each town, and they wanted to ask questions. Well, you know, I answered a few questions in because of all the uh, brass around, the badges around and all that. And I could understand 
them worried about a uh, some kind of invasion going on. Well, then when they got through, they was just as nice as they could be. You know, they didn't get out of hand or anything. They said, well, y'all can go. So we went back out and got in a patrol car and was on the way back to the shipyard when uh, they got a call. The sheriff got a call on the radio, told us to come in. There's somebody that wanted to see us. Well, little did I know. I didn't know who Dr. Heineck was and Dr. Harder was. Oh, really? They were there? But already. Now, how they got back there that fast, I don't know. Matter of fact, I asked his son at the convention mm -hmm. if he knew how he got there that fast. And he said, well, he had to be in the area or something. But even, even nowadays, if you was through... Uh, TSA and all, and you got on a plane, you still couldn't fly from California down here that fast. But anyhow, Dr. Heineck and them was already there. Well, they took us into a uh, room. They put Charlie, went to see Dr. Harder. I was with Dr. Heineck first. And Dr. Heineck just asked simple old questions. You know, it made me feel pretty comfortable around him except for the stare, stare that he gave. And for the people that don't know, Dr. Heineck was over Project Blue Book. Which was, was actually closed at this time. Right, which had shut down. And I, I didn't think he would have any business there, and I didn't know what the heck Project Blue Book was. But he interrogated us, and I wouldn't call it an interrogation, just to sit down and talk. And then Charlie and I changed places, and Charlie came in there and talked to Heine. I went to scene harder. And uh, when we got through, he said, well, I need to go out to where this happened. And uh, I know y'all don't feel like going out there tonight, but I'll get the sheriff or somebody to take me out there and show me. So Charlie and I left and went back to his apartment. And we were supposed to meet Heineck again the next morning. So Heineck had went out to the uh, site where all this happened and checked it. And I remember him being upset at the sheriff and all, saying this should have been ribbing it off and somebody should have been out there looking because we need to find evidence if there's any. Well, when he got through with us, I turned around and... Uh, he said, well, y'all can go. Well, to make a long story short, I got hired, fired, and a physical all in the same day. So, you less know. Less than that, 24 hours time. Yes, indeed. Less than 24 hours. I lost the job. I went down there, too. So I, I really decided to go back to uh, my hometown, which is Laurel, Mississippi. Right. So I left and was driving back. And it seemed like it took me forever to get home. I got in, and of course, my family already knew about it, but they hadn't seen me in a, in a while. And uh, But the thing is, I never talked to my family about it, never talked to my friends about it. It was just something that I figured would go away after a week or two. Did they respect that? Did they not question you? None of them ever questioned me. Nobody did. And the reason I don't think they did, because Charlie and Daddy was pretty good friends, and Charlie had called Daddy up and told him how upset and all that I was. And uh, Daddy had went out to see uh, the woman I was engaged to and talked to them and their, her family. So they never asked me about nothing, and I never brought it up. But the only thing that was going on when I got home, the news media was there beating on my doors. Mm -hmm. Now, how they found me back in 73, off in the woods, kind of hid, I don't know. But they did. Well, I started out, I was going to be nice, give an interview, and uh, talk just for a minute. 
by the time they got it all changed up and all that, I said, no more interviews or nothing unless it's with law enforcement. So that's kind of the way me and my wife left it. We, uh, I started taking odd and end jobs, going here and going there. And, you know, we was making a living. But I didn't want to uh, talk about this to anybody. So it changed the whole cycle of my life. It, it went from uh, me getting married and buying a house having children, having grandchildren, and retiring and fishing. And that's the way I had my life planned out. But it changed everything. So, um... Can I interrupt you and ask you a question? Sure you can. Thank you. When you were talking about, when I asked you, didn't you fight back? Didn't you strike this, this creature? Did, and it was the 1993 experience because Sherry had asked if you had been revisited. And I wanted to ask about your implant. When all of this stuff was going on, you had bleached yourself. I think that was very intelligent because I would have been concerned because they touched me too. And you have an implant they come back in 93. Tell me about that experience, if you would. This actually, uh, um, in May of 93, I told my wife that, uh, you know, I'm going fishing. I'm going out to the islands, go fish, but I will be home before dark because I didn't go out after night anymore fishing. So I got my boat and left and run to the island. It was about a 25, 30 minute run over there. And I was anchored up, waiting on a tide to change and get ready to eat my lunch. And this is where the blondie sandwich come in that I was telling you about. <laughs> yeah. I had a blondie sandwich and uh, was getting ready to eat. Well, I, uh, I noticed there was a cloud, a big cloud above. And I was laying there just looking at the cloud, and I didn't realize what it was. And out of the cloud, you could see the bottom of something, and it just kind of pulled me up into it. It was just like you see in Star Trek, beam me up, Scotty, you know. And uh, it pulled me up. And what what had happened when I got there, it was the, the same female alien. Now, this is... 20 years later, or she appeared to be the same, and she didn't appear to be ages. And somebody asked me, well, reckon she had on a uh, mask or something. And she could have, you know, some kind of costume. So she looked the same to me. And she had uh, got me, and I was on the table, but she had me pushed up against the wall trying to get her fingers down, up in my nasal cavities. And that's when I decided, you know, look, I've had enough of this. I'm not putting up with it. I don't care if I live. I don't care if I die. But there's one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to have her as a testimony to what happened because I'm fixing to grab her and uh, wrap my arms around her neck and jump out the door if I can find the door. And when they find my body, I'm going to have her in my hands. We actually got into a physical fist fight, more or less, there. I took and grabbed her by the neck, and I beat her head against the wall. And uh, she was starting to bleed bad. She was bleeding black blood. It was coming from her eyes, her nose, or her, her head, you know, out of her ears. Because I physically know I physically hurt her. But I couldn't find a door to get out of. And she summons the same robotic-looking creature to uh, come over. And he grabbed me by the arm, and he injected me again with something where I couldn't fight back. And the next thing I knew, 
I, I this started at about 11 o'clock in the day. I was supposed to be home by dark. Next thing I knew, I got up and it was dark. And I started going home in the boat. And it was three in the morning when I got to my truck and looked at the time. Holy wow. That's so, a good bit of lost time there. A lot of missing time. And uh, I, the next morning, a friend of mine came over to the house and asked me what's going on. I said, well, you know, look, I got all this time I can't account for it all. And told him about that. Well, he was actually a reporter for WXXB Channel 25. And he had been hunting me to do a story. And I would never give him a story, but uh, we become fr pretty good friends. So uh, he said, well, did you catch any fish? I said, I ain't caught the first fish. He reached over and opened the cooler up, and it was full of fish. And that was a big cooler. So they were giving you a cover story. Yeah, I guess. Well, makes as much sense as anything else that would have put fish there. Yeah. Right? That's just so it, weird. It did. It, that was odd right there. And he said, look, I know a man that deals with this. He's wrote a book on missing time. We need to go to Tampa, Florida. He's at a uh, conference there speaking. And this guy was Bud Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, you know, I don't want to go to none of these conferences and talk to nobody. I don't want nobody to know who I am or what I'm doing. I've been hiding from this for 20 years now. But I did agree to go talk to Bud Hopkins. But I wouldn't go in the conference. He said, well, I'll go in and tell him. So they went inside the conference and told Bud who I was. He said, oh, I've been wanting to talk to him for a long time. Y'all please go to my room, and I'll meet y'all over there when I get through. Well, we went to Bud Hopkins' room. He gave us a key to it. And we waited on him. And it wasn't long. Bud showed up in uh, to the room, introduced himself. And he said, Calvin, please let me hypnotize you. I said, well, no, I don't want to be hypnotized and made to look like a fool. But I finally agreed to let Bud Hopkins hypnotize me. And uh, I told Bud, I said, look, I don't want you putting anything in my head. I've seen these floor shows in Las like Vegas. Like a chicken when you hear a sound or something. I understand. I'd have been yeah. thinking that, too. I said, I've seen these floor shows in Las Vegas, and I've seen some of the stuff the crowd does. I said, number one, I don't believe I can be hypnotized. Number two, you don't put nothing in my head that ain't there. And don't you give me any suggestions. Right. And he said, well, I won't. I said, look, now here's a better deal. There's a ball bat in the trunk of my car just for emergency use like this. And I'm going to, if you start doing this stuff, this friend of mine is going to beat you over the head with that ball bat and hand it to me. And then you're, he's going to leave. Well, you don't have nothing like that to worry about. So <coughs> I asked uh, my buddy and his wife if they would stay in the room. And it was some more people there. Uh, couple, another couple. I'm going to interrupt well, you and ask you a question. Okay. You, when you were with Bud, you wanted people to stay with you. Right. When you were with Kathy, you did not want your wife in there with you. Was it because you felt like y'all had not talked about this and you were not sure exactly what was going to happen? Well, or were you afraid of what her reaction might be? I didn't know what her reaction was. Now, she did come in and stay with Kathy for a while. I wouldn't let her stay in a room with Bud Hopkins. Cause, okay. Then I had those backwards, and I apologize. Yeah. But I just found yeah. it interesting that that you were concerned for her reaction I was, at that point. I, I wouldn't let her in a room when Bud Hopkins was doing this. Now, with Kathy, you know, we all met at the uh, UFO Congress. 
mm-hmm. got to know each other, spent a week there together. You know, you was there also. Mm-hmm. And our table, Kathy's table was right across. I didn't know her from anybody. Was right across from uh, where we were. Well, in the process, we got to talking and visiting and got to know each other. Well, I found out how um, educated she was with this subject. She even has a background in forensic science and all. Yes, she does. She is a brilliant woman. And she an experiencer is. herself. Yeah. And I built a trust for her. And we are talking about Kathy Martin, who will be joining me in th- in two weeks. So she's going to be coming in, too. Oh, well, great. <coughs> uh, but, oh, but I do know people are sitting here and they're wanting to hear about your regression. I'm so sorry. I interrupted you. And can you go ahead and continue with, with your experience with Bud? Absolutely. And then we'll move to Kathy. Okay. Uh, so I agreed to let Bud do it. Well, it didn't seem like I was in there for two minutes. And uh, actually the session was a couple of hours. Well, I didn't realize it. I didn't even realize I had been hypnotized up until I got ready to write this book. Well, uh, Bud brought me out, but he put a post-hypnotic suggestion in my head. And the reason I know this, because I read it when we got the transcripts in the book. And uh, he regressed me back, put this in my head. And when we got ready to write the book, I had told... uh, Philip, I said, you know, Bud Hopkins tried to hypnotize me, but he couldn't. He said, well, Bud Hopkins is a friend of mine. I know him. He's actually stayed here at my house before, but he's dead now. Do you, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Jacobs if he has still has a take because he took over Bud's work. Well, it wasn't but a day or two. Dr. Jacobs emailed me wanting to know if I, he had permission to give this tape to Philip Mm Mantle. Well, he did. Well, during the meantime, while I was doing the book, well, Philip put this, uh, transcribed all these regressions into writing so he could put it in the book. And he also sent me a tape. Well, I got back and started reading it, and I said, shoot, I was hypnotized. (laughs) And, uh, I went out, my wife was on the porch, and I went outside, and I told her, I said, you know, that idiot Bud Hopkins, and that's what I told her because <laughs> I didn't know him from anybody. I didn't know. Right. And uh, I said, he did hypnotize me. And I said, I started reading, but I stopped reading the transcripts on it because I don't want, as I remember, I want to remember it on my own. I said, why not go in there and read what Philip had transcribed and uh, don't tell me about it. But as I remember, I'm going to tell you, and you see if it matches uh, what I read there. So she did. And this was before the book. And uh, she came out. She stayed back in the room about 45 minutes. And she came out crying. I said, what's wrong? She said, I can't read no more of it. I don't want to uh, get into that. You're going to have to find somebody else and you want to hear about it. Okay. You need to give me about two two minutes and we'll okay. be right back to go back into this. Everybody, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to take a break. We will be right back. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham. Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. 
I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back. This is Fate Mag Radio and WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. And my guest tonight is Calvin Parker. We are in the nitty gritty. We are going through where Wayne Nat has been going through the Bud Hopkins transcript of your hypnosis. And I am just so amazed. And I'm so thankful that you're here tonight to share this. Please go ahead. I hate to have to interrupt you all the time with these breaks. No, that's quite all right. So anyhow, she went, she came back and read it and come back up crying. And I couldn't figure out why she was crying. Because he had put that post-hypnotic suggestion in my head that I wouldn't remember this until it was time for me to remember this. Well, she didn't want to talk about it right then. Mm-hmm. And because it scared her. Right. And after I got into it and started remembering it, I realized that. And what uh, jolted my memory was I did a uh, show with Linda Moulton Howe, and she did some serious investigating and uh, it asked me some questions. And it started coming back to me just like a film in front of my eyes. And I started remembering things. Well, I would go back as I remembered. I would read to the part where I remember in the hypnosis. And it was all dead on. But I never really thought I'd been hypnotized by then. Right. So expected. Yeah. All that was, uh, and it was put into the first book. And then it got reconfirmed when we got back from the UFO Congress where we had met Kathy. I underwent another hypnosis, and it just reconfirmed everything. And this one was, I stayed pretty much conscious, had a conscious memory through all this. And she asked some very intelligent questions, and she didn't lead me into anything. And uh, it's amazing to me how hypnosis works. And I guess it is some people that can't be hypnotized, but I'm not one of them people, you know, because I was hypnotized. Mm-hmm. And well, uh, I had wondered about that, too, because I've got a feeling that that most people can be. Um, before we go any farther... And I know we're going to run out of time, so I want to get this question in. Sherry wanted to know if any of your children had experiences. No, they hadn't. And, uh, you know, I've tried, even through all this, you know, I've tried to protect them from this. Mm -hmm. And if they had had any kind of experiences, they would have come forward with it. Mm -hmm. But um, my daughter lives in... uh, Louisiana. She's married to a dentist. She's a dental hygienist and they really have their uh, life together. And, uh, you know, they hadn't. Of course, my son died a few years back of a drug overdose, just to be honest with you. And he's never mentioned it. Right. And that was one of them things where he just slipped and, you know, I, he got on drugs and I didn't well, realize I mean- it. And you know that my heart is broken for you. We've talked about that. And I think that 
Can I tell people that the reason you're always in that hat is because he gave it to you? Exactly. I think you that's can. just a beautiful thing. And believe it or not, I don't have it on right now, but it's sitting right here on my, you know, that's something I've actually been fishing and going down the river and this hat blowed off my head and I dove out of the boat and it running and went back <laughs> to get the hat, not thinking. And, um, I that's how much it means to me. And it's just the no salvage store fine, 99 cents, I think. And, uh, you know, he thought I needed to have it. And everybody always asked me, what does it say? Because when I went on the travel channel, I had it down there and they said, well, we can't advertise nothing. But it, it don't have no advertisement. It said no. work is for people who don't fish. That's yeah. all it says. But uh, I was offered at uh, McAllen, Texas, I was offered $400 for that old 99 cent cow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And I turned it down. No doubt. One that said, you're an idiot. You're foolish for doing that. Why so, no, not? I'm not. That, that hat and that dog's the two memories I have of him, it's good. <clears throat> and people don't realize how bad drugs are till they go through the rehabs and all this. Yep. But anyhow, you know, the abduction, I could sit here and go into another two hours and still wouldn't really finish the story. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to coming back and we get – get on into uh, what's been going on. Well, I am so excited to have you come back. <laughs> and I know our listeners are too, because oh, I, the things that you've experienced are truly for most people, simply the thing of legend or, or folk tales. And the fact that your experience with beings, you know, you had the robotic looking things that looked like pretty much the tire guy, you know, with horns. Oh yeah. And, um, what did the lady look like? Did she look like that as well? No. What did she look like? You know, I've often told everybody if I'd been in a bar drinking and, uh, wanting a date, I would have tried to pick her up. That's how normal looking she looked. Now, she could have been in some kind of disguise. And or in she a had, form that made you comfortable. Yeah. And her voice even made me comfortable, made me feel like I was talking to a neighbor right out here. And I don't understand. <clears throat> After looking through, uh, when the book was done, I started looking at photos of uh, different aliens that people had seen in different pictures. And mine looks nothing like them. And I didn't understand it. And I'm glad it don't look like them because I've seen no big doubt. lizards I, and black mm -hmm. grasshoppers and everything else. Uh, mine looked just normal, pretty much. Her two middle fingers was the only thing that was off on her. But yeah. she had hair, nose, eyes, mouth. And uh, it was Maybe amazing. that's the part that she couldn't dis disguise because she needed that to do your implant. Do you still have an implant? No, huh? I've been checked. I had open heart surgery, two open heart surgeries and a stroke. And uh, while I, when I had the stroke, they'd done, a, I guess, an MRI, MRI and, and, all, and looked like it had all, everything was gone. Mm -hmm. My open heart surgery, they did the same thing, checking for different things. And, you know, they can't find one if there's one in there. And I feel like after 93 that everything, they pretty much left me alone. I don't know if they found out, you know, I have a violent side to me on that end or not. And I'm not a violent person. That was if, an extreme circumstance. Yeah. If they had just come down and, and uh, asked you, we can talk to you a little while and examine you. Of course, I wouldn't have told them, yeah, because I'm not going to lie to nobody. I didn't want them touching me, but it would have made me feel a little bit better. Right. Well, and, 
Sherry wants to know, do you ever wonder why, out of all the people on this planet, you would have been chosen? Absolutely. And uh, this came out in the second book. The only thing I'm hunting for is uh, why. And, and that's all I'm hunting is why did this happen to me? Who was it? I'm looking for answers. And that is the reason I agreed to pursue this thing for uh, Philip and for my wife for a year. You know, I've always said that October this year I was going to retire and get on my houseboat and go off into the blue and go off grid. And I still fully have intentions of doing that. But, you know, until I get my houseboat ready and all, I can't go off at it right now. <laughs> you're working on that, though. I'm working on I'm just on glad it. you're here this November, that you didn't make October. But um, yeah. Walter wants to know if you have green eyes. And I can't tell. In the picture, they look hazel. And when I met you, they look hazel or white brown. They're, they're light brown. Yeah. So that has something to do with with contactees and things of that nature, which I'm sure you've read all the things there are to read. Yeah, but, I um, got into Walter, researching it pretty good. I imagine so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good gracious. <laughs> you know, I know you did. But, you know, I've only been researching... UFOlogy seriously as you know, a field of study for about four and a half years. I've done this show for five years. I I had seen things prior to you know doing what I do, but I had spoke focused more on the spiritual side of the paranormal. When I started hearing things from people that I knew to be credible, it took my breath. And it made me start getting down on this topic as hard as I could so that I would be knowledgeable about it and able to share information. I am just so impressed with you. You know, I know that that probably why you were taken was because, as Walter put it, y'all were isolated and easy to get, at least the first time. But also I go back to you, your memory of there being a ship large enough to be considered a cutter or a Noah ship out there. And was this possibly something that, you know, started out with us? So, yeah. you know, that's something to, to ponder sometimes, you know, is that why after the experience, they were so anxious to get you to Keesler? And get you checked out because, and they were doing hazmat testing because they knew that was a possibility. Exactly. They knew this had happened because, you know, cutters and ships, because I've seen those all the time in Pensacola Harbor, you know, you cannot move those ships on a dime. No. It takes a while and you would hear them going if they, if they were going. So they had to still be there when this was happening. Exactly. And, and uh, that's probably why Hynek got there so fast. Well, that that's always puzzled me. And since then, I speak to his son on a regular basis. He's actually been on a couple of shows with me, Paul. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's just a great little pleasure to be around. I've met some really great people here. Uh I got there's a guy guy named Johnny Cobb and he wrote a yes. song and, and that, that was amazing to me. That link is actually in the information for the event too. Because that's yeah. a great song. It it was. That was amazing how he put this together and it got me to thinking, look at all these people that's helped me and uh you know, been through this and you know, it, it's just amazing that you get out and you meet such kind people and uh, able to talk about it. That don't think you're crazy. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. Sherry, and we've, we're going to have to go, but I've got to ask you, 
She wants to know, do you believe the government is aware of aliens and that they hide things? Like, do you think Area 1 is holding evidence of such? I think if there's anything at Area 51, there's nothing other than craft. So, I don't, I I don't have... think nothing's at Area 51. No bodies or aliens like that. Mm-mm. But who knows? Uh, right. But I'm sure that the government knows about what's going on because they got too many eyes in the sky. And too many people's coming forward now that's been out on ships and everyone, and pilots and all this that seen things. But to the depth of what they know, I don't know. Me and I've, al- I've always heard of men in black. Somebody asked me if I'd seen them. I, I've never had nobody come by like that. Uh, it's just amazing. Yes. You're amazing. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And I, I would love to come back and get on into this a little further. Well, we will. We, yeah, we were talking about you know shooting for January after everybody's schedule gets back right. So we'll see what we can do. And that'll yeah. be before all these things start happening. If you're on that houseboat, you better be checking email every so often. <laughs> <laughs> I will. When you go someplace. So um, go visit those grands. You'll be checking that email. There but, you go. And, you know, tell Waynette, I said that I appreciate her giving you up for a couple of hours here. I've thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. There's so many other questions. I did not even get. I marked off two things. So out of 10 points that I wanted to get to. So you're going to have to come back. I'm so looking forward to that. I'd be happy to. And, you know, we'll we'll just get into all of that. For for everyone listening, thank you so much for being here. I know that this gets downloaded a lot. Folks have things to do sometimes. And, you know, we've just got a big week coming up on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. We've got Paranormal Pride with Denise Pride Moore tomorrow night. I'll be back Wednesday with Paranormal Experienced. Friday is going to be Paraversal Universe with Jennifer and Kevin Malick, as well as Ghost Talk Radio with Shelley Burke Robertson. And next week will be a new edition of Fate Mag Radio, and Linda Godfrey will be joining me. So I'm looking forward to that. I've never had a chance to have a conversation with her, and I so admire her work. This is going to be great, too. But... Until then, remember, be the person you want to see out in the world. Be the friend you'd like to have and just yeah, manifest that happiness. Start each day with the decision that this is going to be a great day. It works, I promise you. And with that being said, Calvin, thank you again so much. I look forward to our next conversation. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm also looking forward. Awesome. It'll be it'll be cold in January, so I don't mind <laughs> sitting in the house. Right, <laughs> tough to fish when because I've gone out there and tried in Biloxi in January, and it is cold. Since when I it lost gets cold, all that weight, I just sit there and shake and mm-hmm. everything. 140 pounds coming off a fat boy's body is a lot of weight. Yes, it is. And That's another person. It is, and and I got get stay cold all the time. Well, I mean, I'm I'm on blood thinner for that, where I had that stroke and all. Yeah, David has to take those too, so I feel you on that. He is often chilly like that too. Yeah, I just can't stand the cold. Now it could get up to 115. It don't bother me. But I'm like that. Gets, I like deserts, but that's because there's no humidity, and I'm used to a Gulf Coast summer, right? Right. Exactly a desert right. summer's nothing. <laughs> but I, I enjoyed the that, weather in Phoenix. I did too. Everybody's like, I, "Oh, it's so hot." Well, not so much. I, like I can't that. say I enjoyed the food. Well, but, I got taken out by some friends in Phoenix one night, and they took me to a pizza place, and Federal Pizza. If you're in Phoenix, go there and eat. But it was awesome. Well, great. But other than that, 
The hotel had the same stuff all the time, but it was good stuff, but it was still yeah, you know, marked menu. Oh, and, uh, we're going to have to go. Okay. <laughs> you guys, thank y'all so much for listening to us. And I just appreciate all of you. Y'all are the reason we do this, the reason that I do all this work and research and a little writing too. We'll talk about that sometime too. Y'all have a great night. Bye. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio.